This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Hello, um, my name is Jacinta Thompson and I'm the Executive Director and Events and Exhibitions Producer of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the land we meet on today is Ghana land and we wish to express our respect for the Ghana people, their elders and ancestors and to also acknowledge the spiritual and cultural relationship the Ghana people have with their land. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here tonight on behalf of the Hawke Centre and the University of South Australia to our event 2022, Reckoning with Power and Privilege. We are co-presenting this event with a conversation and I would like to thank Misha Ketel, editor of The Conversation, and his wonderful team for curating and facilitating tonight's panel session. Um, Misha, I really value our partnership with The Conversation and I look forward to continuing to collaborate with you and the team in future years, so we'll, we'll talk about that after. Um, also, a warm welcome to our speakers, Peter, Andrea and Deirdre. Um, thank you for joining us at the Hawke Centre, so it's lovely to have you here. I would now like to warmly welcome Misha Kachel, editor of The Conversation, who is going to introduce our very fine panellists and facilitate tonight's discussion. Thank you. Thank you everybody for coming tonight. Um, it's great to see you all. Uh, you are the stayers, the people who committed and then actually managed to make it out, which is terrific, because there's always a few who get to that time in the day and go, oh, I'm not really up for this tonight. Um, we're actually here to launch the Conversations um, Annual Yearbook, which is 2022 Reckoning with Power and Privilege. I should know how much it costs. I should be able to say like $29.95, available through all good bookstores. But um, uh, if anybody wants to to grab a copy of this. I think there are some copies available outside. Um, this is a collection of some of the best pieces written by authors of the conversation in the um, through the past year. And what we're going to do with this panel discussion tonight is really try to look back on the key things that have happened in the course of 2022, which has seemed in many ways like a momentous year, um, and really try to make an assessment of what has actually changed, what is significant, and what is not, and what is likely to happen next. I think there's a whole world of news around us. You know, I'm sure some people here might have been following, as I have very closely, what's happening in the US midterm elections um, and the surprise result there. Um, obviously, this was a, a momentous year in terms of we had a, a change of government in Australia. Um, you know, all over the world, there have been really significant things that seem like there are the signs of some sort of form of change. Um, now, tonight we've got an absolutely terrific panel um, to help us unpack these questions. Um, I'm not going to do introductions that are too long, um, but just very briefly, just to introduce everybody, Peter Martin is the um, economics and business editor of The Conversation. Um, he has been a journalist for quite a long time. Um, he's also uh, worked in the Department of Treasury. Um, he worked with the ABC for a lot of years. Um, you'll probably see see him on TV shows like The Drum uh, talking about and explaining budgets and doing economic analysis and um, he's a really terrific thinker on questions around economics and economic policy questions so we're very lucky to have him so thank you Peter. Over on the end here we have um, Andrea Carson who is an academic. Professor Andrea Carson works at La Trobe University um, but I actually first met her many years ago in the newsroom of the Age newspaper in Melbourne where um, I was a very green young cadet journalist and Andrea seemed very glamorously hard bitten. Um, <laughs> she was doing the industrial relations round. She was reporting on the rise of a, of a young union official by the name of Bill Shorten I think at the time who was sort of coming to focus as somebody who was going to play a larger role in um, in sort of Australian politics. Um, but since then, Andrea's gone on to do a whole bunch of interesting things. She was, for many years, a producer for John Fain on ABC Radio in Melbourne. Um, she's moved into academia and written a number of books. 
Um, in fact, I think you've got a new book coming out pretty soon with Dennis Muller. In about 10 days, okay. Misha. <laughs> and um, that book's on a really interesting and, and controversial topic, actually, which is um, the ethics of undercover reporting. Is that right? That's right. And, and what are you saying, just in a capsule for everybody, just to... Uh, we look at case studies that you might remember, like Cambridge Analytica and the way that they interfered in election campaigns and stole Facebook data, uh, and a number of other case studies, including One Nation working with the NRL in the US, um, the intervention there by Al Jazeera. Yeah, great. And um, Andrea's also always been really interested in um, questions around information, misinformation, disinformation, which we're going to come to a bit later on. Um, but that's a topic that's very important to me because one of the things that we're trying to do at the conversation is make sure that um, there is a stream of quality information available to people at a time when there are a lot of sources of information that are unreliable. Um, and we can see um, in many ways the consequences of that, that misinformation in sort of decisions that are being made and, and things that are happening. So um, it's a really important topic we're going to come back to. Um, we're also very lucky to have um, Deirdre Ted Mason. Um, who is the Dean of Programs for the University of Australia's Justice and Society. Um, so that's areas like law, um, arts, um, you know, a, whole, a whole range psychology, of... Psychology, social work. Social work. <laughs> Aboriginal studies. Yeah. Yeah. So Deirdre was telling me before that she's done quite a bit of work with Indigenous communities in the APY lands, um, has a sort of strong research interest there, but also spans really the full range of sort of politics and political science and sort of all those really interesting, juicy, media questions questions you're going to come to. So thank you, Deirdre. It's great to have you here as well. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe I'm going to start with, start with you, Deirdre, and I'll start sure. with that sort of juicy question to begin with, which is, um, you know, we've, we've had an election in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think is the most significant change we've seen in politics this year? Yeah, great question. Well, um, I was thinking earlier, Misha, how uh, if we were in January or February this year, who could have predicted what would happen in May and this massive change uh, to the political landscape with the election of the Albanese Labor government. And so reflecting back, it's actually only been, um, you know, a matter of months, uh, but it seems now that's bedded in and we take almost take it for granted. But looking at that change, um, you know, bringing in a changing from Scott, uh, Scott who, um, you know, <laughs> now to Albanese who had 25 years of waiting and working and, you know, uh, I think the article in the um, terrific compendium talks about him being both a conviction politician but also uh, someone who's humble, who spoke on election, uh, the election win very much about service to the Australian people. So a different tone, a different setting. Um, but with that election came, of course, the incredible sweep of the teals and uh, the impact that had. And again, I don't think even two or three months out, people would have predicted it. So a real sense of ground up change, a sense that people's concerns about uh, the climate um, were really fueling what was a, a really, I think, surprising result. And whilst it might seem like radical change, I think the thing that was significant there is that these were liberals in distress. These were people who were absolutely wanting to see fun fundamental change, um, primarily in the Liberal Party, but also uh, across the board. But the win against Josh Frydenberg um, was particularly incredible. And the amount of, um, uh, I suppose, resistance to the Teals initially, and I think the media's prediction that this was a bit of a one-off, is now, you know, we're now in a period where we need to assess whether or not this is long-lasting change. These were professional women. Um, big long ped pedigrees, at least with a couple in uh, in the Liberal Party, and is this a sustained change? Um, you know, we're coming up to talk about IR issues and other issues post budget, and you can see already people are beginning to get a little bit uh, nervous as we move into pretty pretty strong political territory. So I think that was a 
a very powerful, um, powerful shift um, uh, this year politically. But with that as well, um, Dai Li uh, in Fowler. I mean, it wasn't just the Liberal Party that lost um, seats to that sort of local uh, action. We also saw uh, Christine Keneally's loss and a very big lesson for the Labor Party there uh, about what local action and also multicultural Australia was having to say about elections and not just um, not just having anybody come in, whatever their credentials, but losing a safe, uh, what would have been a safe Labor seat. So the notion of safe seats, I think, has shifted. So looking at that, what is the sustained change? What is that local momentum really looking much more positively going to give us? And I, I did look at one of the stories, I read them all in the book, and it's fabulous, um, but one by two Aboriginal uh, women, Bronwyn Carlson and uh, Linda Coe. And again, Linda being a descendant of Paul Coe, who was very powerful, for those of you who know, in uh, the New South Wales Redfern movement that saw the first Aboriginal legal service and medical service. That article is looking back on 50 years of the tent embassy in Canberra and uh, plotting how, when it first started, people gathered on the lawns in front of Parliament House, wanting their voice to be heard, wanting to set up an embassy because people felt they were um, homeless in their own land and seeking that. And uh, the old Parliament House, uh, under the McMahon government, sending in the police to shift them on, realising they didn't have the power to do that. So moving a change to the ordinance to outlaw people camping in front of Parliament House. So we saw um, you know, a really quite violent response to that local protest from Aboriginal people. And I was reflecting, here we are, having seen the victory of the Labor government, the call for the voice and a commitment to do that in the first year of this, um, uh, of this 47th parliament and how people had waited 50 years you know, back in time on the lawns in front of the parliament house you know, really knocking at the door, saying, we belong, we are here, we are the first peoples of this nation, we're not refugees in our own country, and we're still, 50 years on, at the same point as a nation. So whilst a lot has changed, a lot has stayed the same. That's um, in interesting in terms of one of the other things that people have talked about in this election, which is the change in the actual composition of the parliament, the people who are actually being represented. Um, what do you think has been the extent of that change, and, and what do you think is the significance of it? Yeah, really, really great question too, Misha. <laughs> um, Tim uh, uh, South Palmer says a um, uh, small contribution in the book as well, again, is a powerful one. And uh, he was talking about that, that sweep of local energy that brought people of different colour and, and non-European non backgrounds, overseas born, overseas born people into the parliament, seeing 15 um, uh, from overseas, 11 Indigenous parliamentarians. And I was reading it, feeling really excited about that diversification and how you know, quite profound that is, only to be reminded that in terms of proportion of the population, with 20 21% of the population being uh, uh, people who are non-Euro heritage. And that shift in the parliament, which I think all of us would have seen as quite dramatic and quite optimistic, is uh, only rep represents 10%. Um, so we're actually halfway to what would be a reasonable representation in our parliament. So again, it's a reminder that um, what's on the surface, you know, belies that deep structural racism in the country, the deep resistance there is to the opportunity of people of difference to actually be recognised. Um, there's a very strong uh, political and social theory around the politics of recognition that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and I think that's something that we're really grappling with in the country at the moment. Okay. I want to come back to the voice to parliament because it's such an important topic and we're going to need to spend some time on it. But before I do that, I, I might just move to Peter. Um, one of the things that, that you've done in, in your role is, you know, obviously covering the significant, you know, the new government's most significant policy document, which is its budget. Um, and 
you know, you've you said to me that um, really, you know, that that budget was very much shaped by circumstances. Do you think um, the Labor government could have predicted what was going to happen before? The no one predicted or could have predicted. And I know this because at the beginning of the year, we, we survey uh, economists at the beginning of the year and the middle of the year, about the year ahead, or the financial year ahead. And I wrote the headline, top economists expect RBA to hold rates low in... <laughs> <laughs> and, and further down, further down there was a subhead, you know, we try and, as an editor, we try and make it interesting because blocks of text aren't nice, so we have subheads. But further down there was a subhead, inflation not yet a problem. Problem. <laughs> that was in February, right? Okay. Um, by May, the Reserve Bank, and uh, March uh, in the US, uh, the Reserve Bank had begun lifting rates. It lifted them seven times, the uh, second steepest uh, rise uh, on record. Now, no one in uh, uh, the UK at the beginning of the year in the US, where inflation is now approaching 10%, the UK is in recession, uh, US arguably uh, already in recession. Um, no one predicted that. Uh, if you, uh, just to expand on, on that, because I, I got out the forecasts, like the, um, the, the, our panel, the, the uh, panel at the beginning of the year, was forecasting inflation over the year of 2.9%. It's 7.3. You know, they, 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 they forecasted wage growth. They got that right. They forecast wa minimal wage growth of 2.7%. Peter, I'm not sure if I like you highlighting how wrong we got <laughs> how everything. How wrong we've been. The conversation However, is supposed to be about fighting misinformation. We, yeah, well, we had a panel, uh, we had a forecast in the middle of the year that, that turned out to be pretty spot on because by then uh, things had changed. So um, early in the year, the first budget, year of two budgets, hasn't happened since the First World War, two budgets in one year. Uh, early in the year, uh, Frydenberg, um, uh, who, uh, can I share? Uh, Frydenberg used to ring me for consultations. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I, I, although I think partly that was um, the, the technical term is sucking up. Yeah. Uh, so he, he, he used to ring lots of journalists for consultations. What do you think I should do? Partly because he was genuinely interested in, and partly because he didn't really want to know what you thought he should yeah. do, but because he thought you wanted to think you wanted to know. know what, yeah, anyway, <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, and what I, I said, and, and said that the, the previous year was crank it up further. So we had got unemployment down. At the time of that budget, we got it down to 4%. That was unheard of for five decades, right? We'd got it down where it was, uh, you know, early in the Whitlam period. Uh, and we had done that by the economy had been run really hot in order, um, because unemployment, if you take into account zero hours worked, during COVID, unemployment got up to 15% if you mm. count uh, non-work as unemployed, which it wasn't because of job keeper and, and, and so on. So um, uh, I wrote a piece and uh, uh, also Ross Garneau uh, wrote a, a book, uh, in his book, I argued that given that inflation is dead, was dead, um, we, uh, we have to see just how far, and given that we've broken the, you know, my friend Robin Williams, so this is the, the science unit, he had a motto, if you, as he would instruct us, if us junior science reporters, if you must sin, sin boldly. <laughs> given, given that he'd already broken his idea of getting back in the black, he'd already said, uh, well, we're going to just borrow and spend. Um, I said to him, uh, Gano said to him, you've done it now, you may as well see how far you can push it. Unemployment then was 4%. We got it down to 3.4%. Um, and that was by, in that budget, a lot of money came in uh, that wasn't expected. Uh, and uh, he spent half of that, again, to try and ramp things up further. So, move forward. We had all that inflation I talked about. What uh, uh, the completely unexpected inflation, and inflation of this order is really bad, really bad. 
you might not think it's bad, but that's because those of you who are young have never experienced going to the shops and thinking you're going to have to go back that week because next it's going to be more expensive otherwise, uh, trying to enter into contracts or take a job where you think you'll get a pay rise, you, you think you'll get another 10% because you've changed employer and discovering it's worthless. Um, uh, we've, we, we've now had that. We've got moved from negligible inflation to really bad inflation. And so the appropriate response was the opposite to what Frydenberg did. Frydenberg was right. Of course, I'd say that. He did what I said. Um, and uh, this time when the extra money's come in, this time it's come in from high commodity prices, uh, the new treasurer has spent none of it. And uh, the Reserve Bank has increased on a uh, $500,000 mortgage, which is not atypical for a new mortgage at all, um, has increased repayments by about $800 a month. We're doing that because that's what you need to do to fight inflation. Uh, I back both treasurers. They've done completely different things, but the circumstances have changed. Okay. So you think that uh, although they're, they're sort of running almost exactly opposite directions, that they're both the right policy responses to the circumstances? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess... Uh, and also, I, I really think it's too easy to criticise. Um, maybe it's because I work, and Michelle Grattan works with the two members of the conversation staff who actually work inside Parliament House, and, you know, maybe it's Stockholm Syndrome, you know? <laughs> I mean, you know, we talk to them, they come into the office, the staff come and chat, um, you know, we see them having coffee, we, we, we talk. Um, but more generally, I think, and you've been involved in politics, Deirdre, and you might agree, I don't know, but more generally, I think, that the politicians we have are really good mm. and that they do their job well and people on social media, which is one of your, your, your fields of expertise, Andrea, are far too willing to criticise and I've been, as you said, a journalist for more de decades than you'd like to imagine. I've only been in Parliament House two and a half, one and a half decades but, uh, you know, I think almost all of them, we won't name Scott, uh, or, or is, no, <laughs> Scott who, uh, you know, are, are really well motivated and make good decisions. Sometimes they hand out favours to mates, but on the big issues, and by the way, I, I said before, um, um, before COVID, um, People said to me, you know, gee, it was really great that Labor did all of that great thing getting us out of the GFC with that great spending. And I said, yes, but if it happens to the coalition, they'll do the same thing. And they did. Um, they make the right decisions because they're well advised and they have got heavy responsibility at the right times. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Just I mean, on I that, agree. I, 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 I agree in terms of um, from the gen general public wouldn't know just how hard working and you know uh, uh, sincere. I think we do have good uh, good political class uh, in the parliament across the board. But I think what can happen too easily is that people end up with um, uh, things in common among them as a class of politicians. You mean and both they forget sides? Both sides, you know, and, um, and people forget actually what it's like to actually struggle um, for the next thing you've got to buy or be facing 800, you know, extra in your mortgage or whatever it might be. So I, whilst I agree with you in a positive sense, I also think the downside of that and hence that um, refresh in, uh, in that sort of ground up uh, accountability to various publics uh, is actually healthy as well. Yes, so $210,000 for right. an MP. And Cathy McGowan, after one term, as she said she would, gave it away and mm. said uh, it'll be you know, the next person in my electorate. Exactly. Um, you know, yeah. Exactly. So I'm that's... probably going to have to disagree with Good. both of you. <laughs> uh, I think we've got a mixed bag of politicians. I don't think we can agree that Scott Morrison secretly having five portfolios uh, that didn't come to light was in the public interest. 
Scott who? Yeah. I think Scott who? that some of our politicians have deliberately spread mis and disinformation around vaccines and have shown vaccine hesitancy, which has gone against the public message and again against the public good. Uh, you pick out people like Kathy McGowan, she's an exemplar. I mm. don't think um, that represents all of the 151 politicians in the lower house or the 76 in the upper house. And this is reflected in the polls. We see that Australians are increasingly disenchanted with their politicians. And this is a global trend. Democracy has been tracking down for the last 15 years. Um, if you use any indice, whether it's Freedom believe, House or so forth. So much better? Aren't we so much better than the US? I think you're going to a really low bar there, and I think, <laughs> I think we can do better. <laughs> May I say how nice it is to be in Adelaide the first time since the pandemic for me. So thank you all oh, for coming out. So um, that's interesting, Peter, because j just on just going back to a second, what you're talking about the, the class of politicians. I think one thing that we forget in this is the role of the public service. Um, I was very interested, for example, this year to see that um, Glyn Davis, the former vice chancellor of Melbourne University, Griffith yes. University, who was very active in the 30 review of the public service, has been appointed to run Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. And I know you've you've worked in the public service and you were saying just before that you think the politicians are well advised. What do you think about where the public service is currently and do you think that there are areas where there is work that needs to be done? It's much better than people think it is. Really? I, I, I don't think it's as... It's not, it's not that it was so much demoralised as that it went into hibernation a bit because Scott Morrison said, he actually gave a speech saying we will uh, decide, us the politicians, us ask the experts what to do and you will implement, um, which of course he didn't do. <laughs> you know, when COVID came, he was all ears. Um, so the, the, there are two roles. One is to work out what should be done, give them all the options and all the information, and the other is when they have decided to implement uh, what they've uh, done. And so, to some extent during the Morrison years, and also during the Howard years, I remember talking to Ken Henry, uh, the tre Treasury head, during the Morrison years, and uh, you know, I said, how do you feel about them not acting on what you're doing? And he sort of said words to the effect of, there's time, you know. We'll, we'll see what happens. There might be a change of government. Um, and, uh, you know, what you're finding now, um, an area I know a, a, a bit about is the, the women's area um, for various reasons. And um, the uh, Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, which has uh, responsibility uh, for that, is as soon as the same people, uh, the, the Office of Women, uh, as soon as the election changed, that, or actually before before the election, they were ringing up saying, ringing up uh, groups such as Chief Executive Women and so on, saying, um, what ideas have you got? We want them. But that was before the election because they, they wanted them for the election. But as soon as um, the new government came in, they said, right, give us what you want. Big asks. So it's almost like I don't think the public service has been hollowed out, not to the extent that people think. Um, and uh, they're good people. One of them, uh, who's uh, now the head of a government department and was previously deputy secretary, um, said, what you do, you have ideas, and they might uh, never, you know, they might not be well received. You keep it in your knapsack because it's still a good idea. And you saw this on Newstart. So the, the, the public service for, for, for years, uh, uh, you know, it was common sense that Newstart or whatever they call it now, uh, job, uh, job seeker, seeker yeah. was, uh, you know, ridiculously low. <clears throat> and as soon as there was a crisis, as soon as there was COVID, right, now's the time. And they doubled it. Uh, you know, and it's, it, uh, it was undoubled later and, and, and so on. But um, I think there are good people with good ideas just waiting for the, uh, the chance. And it is right, that the, of course, that the politicians make the final decisions. Um, but it's in the character of people in the public service not to take it personally and not to be dismayed 
and uh, you know to, to take the opportunities. There's also a blurring of boundaries. I think we've seen in the last period of time, and we're, and we're seeing more now with the Royal Commission coming out about things like robo debt. You know the horrific things that have been done in public administration in the country. We saw the outsourcing of the whole running of the cashless debit card with the Indu Bank, mm. which was really just a, a you know uh, I think the political economy of that of actually handing the administration and the delivery of absolutely critical welfare policy to um, uh, I'm thinking privatise it. In, in, in Canberra, we have a distinction between, which is a class thing almost, between policy departments, which are the, yes. the, 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 the serious people who do what I'm talking about, and implementation yes. departments. Uh, and uh, yes, the implementation. Oh, Peter, what, it, what, it, what, it sounds what, like we need a, a new role, the ambassador for Canberra. Um, <laughs> I think that could be something that's... Oh, I, I was born do. in Adelaide. Yeah. <laughs> um, look, I might just bring in Andrea there, because while we're talking about the public service, um, one of the things, Andrea, that you mentioned to me before was the role of the um, Australian Electoral Commission in uh, during the course of the election um, in terms of making sure that the public was informed. Can you tell us a bit about what you've been researching on misinformation and disinformation and and what you sort of know about how this election was, was handled? <laughs> Yeah, sure. It's a big question there, Bisha. So I guess just to pull the lens back a little bit, you've asked what's changed. And one of the things that we haven't spoken about yet um, about why the economic circumstances have changed is because of the war in Russia, or the Russian invasion, illegal invasion into the Ukraine, which has changed commodity prices and the demand and supply chain. But what it also has done, to get to your point, Misha, is there's a war also going on around information Information. And a large part of um, Russia's campaign in Ukraine is putting out disinformation around the globe. We saw that first with the false flag arguments about why they had to do the invasion. And this is a global problem, and in my view, it's one of the biggest problems that we face in the modern era, and that is knowing what information we can trust. What is, how do we know what's real? How do we know what's not real? Fake news is not a new problem, but what is new is that it has global reach and can spread across the other side of the world in a matter of seconds, because we're all interconnected through the internet. And one of the big problems, um, to speak to the Australian Electoral Commission, is Donald Trump introduced this term of fake news into our lexicon in 2016. You might remember when he went around and said to journalists, you're fake news, you're fake news, I'm not taking a question from you in 2017 when he was president-elect. And from there, he used that terminology frequently um, throughout his term and introduced that into our lexicons. Unfortunately, there's been a contagion effect and we see other politicians also weaponizing that language of fake news to delegitimize the mainstream media. This causes immense harm because it confuses people about what's real and what's not. The Australian Electoral Commission in the 2022 election foreshadowed that there might be some of that contagion effect about the election being rigged or about the election being stolen. Australia's. It foreshadowed that there would be some actors that would be putting out that mis and disinformation. So what it did is it went to the big tech platforms, Facebook, Google, Apple, Microsoft and so forth, and it signed a pact with them to work out how to deal with this disinformation if it starts to emerge before the election campaign began. And I applaud them for this move because there was incidents of um, mainly from Palmer supporters and some coming from One Nation supporters that were saying that the election lacked integrity, that there was, um, that the people who weren't vaccinated weren't going to be allowed to vote. There was, I don't want to repeat all the disinformation, but if you want to see it, the Australian Electoral Commission has played a very transparent role and has put 32 different pieces of mis- and disinformation up on the website. Um, and because it had those agreements in place, it was able to take that down before the egg got scrambled. Because once it's out there, it's very hard to bring it back. But this is an ongoing problem that was dealt with for this election campaign. Um, but we still, as a society, no one's got the perfect answer on how to deal with mis- and 
disinformation yet. It was interesting actually because during the campaign, for example, there were Clive Palmer had the big billboard saying interest rates will be three <laughs> percent um, under under Clive Palmer. Which I mean, you know, if Clive Palmer had, had the capacity to form a government, I think would be in a very interesting situation right now. Published an article about that, um, sort of uh, going through the mechanics, the, how possible that would be. Yeah, yeah exactly. But um, in other words, we debunked it. Yeah. Not, not everyone reads us, but that's one of the things we do. Well, we try. <laughs> But, but one of the things I think is interesting, Andrew, you're talking about the fact that across the world there is attempts to legislate or to try to deal with this. What, what, what's your sense of what's happening and do you think there are pitfalls? Because, I mean, it is one of the things that's very difficult is saying that interest rates are going to be 3% under a, under a Palmer government is unfalsifiable because they're never going to form government and um, even if they did, they could just say circumstances changed or whatever. And, and you do need to have a, a space for the political conversation um, so, on the one hand, I'm really optimistic about what you said about the role of the AEC in this election. On the other, uh, there's a lot of power being exercised in a way when you're deciding about information, and I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, it's a really important question, Misha, and it's one of the reasons that I commend you on the book that you've produced, because it reminds us of the importance of quality information and quality journalism. So the world, um, countries around the world are dealing with mis- and disinformation information in four different ways, broadly speaking. Some countries are legislating against fake news, and I would say to that we need to exercise extreme caution. It's no coincidence that the countries that are going down that path are not considered democracies, are considered electoral autocracies or various versions of um, authoritarian regimes. Singapore and Indonesia have gone down that path. And what else is problematic about that is the government then becomes the decider of what is fake news, they define it, and they also enforce it. And it's no coincidence that in Singapore, for example, they have a 10-day election period. In 2020, they used their anti-fake news law um, more times than any other period that it had come into being. And who did they use the law against in that 10 days? Against journalists and against political dissidents or against opposition. The government in Singapore has been in power for 62 years. And you can appeal uh, if you get POFMID, that's the law in Singapore um, where you, your story gets stamped as being fake news or it gets taken down. You can appeal it, but guess how long the appeal takes? More than 10 days. The election period's 10 days, so they've effectively silenced opposition. So we need to be very cautious about wanting to legislate. Uh, the other mechanism is where the EU has gone down, which is having mandatory co-regulation. It started off with voluntary co-regulation. What that means is the big tech companies Companies, Facebook, Google, Twitter, and so forth, um, come together and agree to certain principles and how they're going to manage mis- and disinformation on their platforms. They started off with that being a voluntary mechanism, but they found there were too many gaps. The platforms were dealing with things differently. They were opting into some things, not opting into others, and that was unsatisfactory. So now it's mandated. Australia is still in that early stage. We introduced the mis- and disinformation code of conduct in 2021. If I was to make a prediction, I think we will move down the EU path and watch this Labor government. They'll move from making that a voluntary code to mandating it as the problem of mis and, mis and disinformation continues to create havoc. And then the final way that governments are dealing with this is non-regulatory, non-legislative measures such as funding fact-checking, mitigation measures, public literacy around what is real, what isn't real, um, educating kids in schools, those sorts of things. So there's lots of different strategies. Not one works. Um, we need a raft of measures to deal with this problem. And it's also incumbent upon all of us that if we don't know the source or we don't trust something, not to just share it. Because um, once you let that genie out of the bottle, it can cause real world harms. And we really got to see that with the pandemic where misinformation, which is falsehoods that are spread without malice, but they're still false. False remedies about COVID has caused deaths. So we need to be so careful about how we treat information. Disinformation, on the other hand, is where information is deliberately spread, usually for to cause harm, as in the case of Russian disinformation, or it's caused for financial gain. 
So just on that idea about you know, letting the genie out of the bottle with misinformation and, and the importance of guarding against it, um, you've done some research on fact-checking because I think one of the things that, that we have um, in sort of the journalistic world is this idea that you let a thousand flowers bloom, you let everybody have their say, and then it sort of all comes out in the wash of public discourse. Um, and one of the things that we've often put our faith in is this idea that we can fact-check and debunk misinformation. But does that actually work? Yes and no is the answer to that. So this idea of the contest of ideas and the most robust ideas survive, that might have been the case, and I'm not sure it is. I think we have rose-coloured glasses on that when we look back in the past. The problem is we don't all get equal access to put ideas forward at the same time because we've got algorithms with the platforms that determine what we see and what we don't see. So that contest of ideas is skewed right from the beginning. Fact checking is one way to be able to present in a rational way, here's what the claim is, here's the evidentiary basis to show why this is false. The problem that we're finding with our research, I'm working with um, some international academics as well as the University of Melbourne, is that yes, fact checking can disabuse us of what's false. However, in our study, people still share it anyway. And 28%, I should say. Um, this is looking at political fact checks. And so when we ask people why they share it anyway, we see that that critical, rational thinking that many of us have, we also are emotional beings. And sometimes people share things because they decide they really dislike Scott Morrison. They know it's false, but they want to share it anyway. Or they really support Scott Morrison and they want to show other people what other people are saying about him, which was the example that we used in our study. So I think that speaks to fact-checking might be one part of the solution, but it's not the entire solution, and we need to have a raft of tools in the tool belt if we're going to deal with this um, global problem. I think one of the other things that you run into with information is sort of uh, the way that information changes through time. And um, one of the things I was interested in actually was the um, Albanese government has legislated now for its um, independent anti-corruption commission. And one of the criticisms that's been made of that commission is the idea that um, some of the hearings are going to be held in secrecy and they will only become public most where yeah, most of them will be held in secrecy. And a lot of people have said they've been very critical and they've said, well, if the whole idea is about transparency and holding politicians to account, um, sunlight is the best disinfectant and we should actually hold all of this in public. My view on that actually has been that there is a good reason to hold some of these um, investigations and inquiries in secret because one of the risks is that if you're inquiring into somebody um, and it's a legitimate inquiry and the information gets out, that person can be tarred as being guilty in the media irrespective of what the ultimate findings are because the way that the media works is the fact that you're being investigated will be reported actively on page one or page three. If you know, three months later the inquiry comes out with the findings and you're exonerated, that ends up being a page seven story. And there is a chance that um, something like an anti-corruption commission could be misused by people who want to score points against political opponents. We've actually seen interesting things um, around that. For example, in there's an election going on in Victoria and there's been a lot of criticism of the, of the Andrews government and old stories have been, have been sort of revived around that. Uh, and I'm just wondering, do you think that, Andrea, that these sorts of problems with the way that information flows in the media, there is anything that we can do about them? Is this like a media regulation question? Um, is there any way that we can ensure that information that is partial, but that can be used, for example, for political purposes, can't be misused? Or is that just a matter that we have to leave to, to politics to work out? Well, I think the answer to that's embedded in the example that you've given, that in Australia we've never had unfettered free speech and we really need to differentiate between what is responsible speech and what is free speech. We've never had the right to go into a, a theatre like this and yell fire erroneously and frighten people. And I think that's the argument that you're getting to about why some of these hearings might be behind closed doors because they can 
can besmirch people's reputations. And without all the evidence going through and getting to the final stage, release of that information prematurely can do long-term reputational damage. And that's where the responsible speech needs to come in. How do we, um, do we regulate? Well, I've already issued caution about passing laws um, about how we moderate speech. I think, and I've just come from Singapore where some of the best brains in the world have been working on this problem from around the globe, and the answer seems to come back to that educative piece, that we need to build resilience in communities, that we can tell what is quality information from what is low quality information, um, that we know that the conversation, for example, is curated by journalists and has academic expertise in it, that's high quality, there's some publications that um, are many rungs below that. And I think it's about educating us all um, to be able to recognise those things. This message is getting through to the platforms in various forms. You might have noticed on Facebook they have a little eye icon with a circle around it where you can click on that and see who the media outlet is, if it's a news story, and find out a little bit more about them. It's using those sort of mechanisms, and I do think that mis- and disinformation code of conduct that came into existence last year, which is currently being reviewed, might get tightened up just to put a little bit more stick, um, not just carry to the platforms to make sure they participate so that when something is harmful, it gets taken down quickly. I, I so, Andrea, I so hate that kind of what you've just said. Which part? I said a few <laughs> things. The individual responsibility part. Um, I just, I instinctively hate it. I, I, I hate it in terms of financial literacy. We're doing lots of pieces in the conversation about financial literacy. I don't think it's reasonable to expect financial literacy. Not everyone is good at maths. Not everyone has done maths. Um, and the, the, the best thing to do in that instance, which is much easier, is to protect people. And the Treasury had its uh, well-being framework, which is sort of being replicated now in, in the budget, and I think five points. And one of them was the level of risk, they should try and minimise the level of risk that individuals had to bear. In other words, there's a role for society, you know, we, we have Medibank or Medicare, right? I shouldn't mention Medibank. Medicare, which, uh, uh, you know, is a national insurance scheme which, which uh, removes risk. The idea that... <laughs> We, we see it in other fields as well. We, we see it in, oh, the solution to climate change is that you should all change your behaviour. Well, yeah, but um, I, I just instinctively don't like that idea. Um, and I don't know if there is another solution, but the idea that you should all be careful is, I think, a real... I don't know if there is another solution, but it feels like a cop-out in a country like Australia where from Federation, uh, you know, from the beginning, uh, and, you know, from the beginning, even, you know, the beginnings of uh, European civilization before Federation, the idea was, you know, we set up the wage-fixing system. The, the idea was that the government looks after you uh, and that you can rely on uh, not being on your own. And this is in this field, this is there's no answer. It's You're on your own. You, you just have to look for ticks and learn what not to trust. They don't like it. It's a shifting of the... Oh, I want to agree with you with that aspect. It's a shifting of the risk to the individual. Yeah. And I think we're having that with COVID. We've moved from actually protecting people to actually saying, you know, you bear the risk we have, yourself. We have deaths. We used to have negative deaths, in other yeah. words. Fewer deaths than normal in the first two years of COVID. And it's actually now we have many more than normal. Yeah. More than normal. And, we, and we're You're doing it own. increasingly, increasingly um, with government services generally shifting the risk. I think there is a balance, though, like picking up with that, what Andrea said. There's some balance where there is an obligation. You know, there's um, rights and responsibilities. There's some obligation, particularly in the education system, for young people to be learning to critically analyse the media, to guard yeah. themselves. Yeah. And so that's, again, government perhaps um, protecting people by educating them to be critically analy analytical. I think we're in a, a state of flux with the disinformation.
information. Okay. This information. I'm going to jump in there, Andrew. I'm just going to give yeah. you like a, a, a quick chance to respond to that, and then I'd like to wrap up and move on because we've only got a little bit of time left, and I really want to get to talking about the voice to parliament. I feel like that's a really important topic. So, do you just want to finally talk about that trade-off between <laughs> say, regulation to try to solve the problems and individual responsibility? How you sort of view that? So, I'd just like to emphasise that I think there's a raft of tools that need to be used. I don't think we can avoid that we all do have some level of responsibility. We're not talking about maths. I think that's a really false equivalence. We all participate in public discourse and we share information. Uh, we share information with friends and family on social media and we need to think twice about how we do that. Of course, there's a role for regulation. That's why the mis and disinformation code of conduct's in place. It's why we do have these other tools and mechanisms. Um, no one in the world has the perfect answer to this. I think the European Union's probably getting closest. Um, and in the meantime, we we need to use what tools we have at our disposal. Yeah. Now look, um, I really want to talk about the voice to parliament issue because the government has, you know, basically said they're going to legislate for this, you know, within the, the lifetime of, of their first term, which means it's coming up very quickly. And I, I don't know how many people would have seen, but there was a really significant Boyer lecture by Noel Pearson um, that was maybe, what, about a week ago it came out. Um, where you know, he's, he said a lot of things which I think we'll get to in a minute about um, how we're placed to do that work. But, but before we do that even, I just wanted to, Andrea, just start with you again because I think as we have this discussion leading up to this uh, decision about the voice to parliament, the role of the media in communicating this is going to be vital. Um, we've already seen some advertising campaigns um, and one of the things that I worry about is the risk of mis or disinformation around some of the these questions. So maybe to start with you, how well do you think the media is equipped to actually host this very important conversation? Do you have any concerns? And if so, what are they about how this might happen? Yes, I do have concerns. And it's probably because um, I'm, I'm thinking here of something John Howard used to say, and that was that you can't fatten a pig on market day. And what he meant by that was that you can't get to the day before an election and suddenly put a message out and expect the public to know exactly what that means or to be on board with that message. Policies and messaging around policies need to develop over time so that people feel like they're being a part of the journey and that you bring them with you. I think it's incumbent upon the politicians and community leaders to articulate the case in such a way that the Australian public doesn't feel threatened. We do know that the bar for getting a referendum through is tough in this country. We've had 48 and eight have been successful. The last successful one was 1977. And it's a, a double um, response that's required. We need to get a majority of overall of um, the country and a majority of the states. So at the moment, we don't have bipartisan support or it's a little ambiguous. Uh, most the referendums that have been successful have had bipartisan support, and I bring that up because it means the messaging has been clear from both sides of politics. I'd like to defer to Deidre, who knows a lot more about the detail about the actual voice to Parliament and what's being proposed. But in terms of that political communication piece, I think it's going to be really important that it's enunciated clearly so that people don't feel threatened. And unfortunately, the no message, which I've heard already on radio coming through from people like Tony Abbott, is a very simple one to grasp. It's if you don't know, say no. So it needs to be a strong message on the other side to counter that. So it's, it's interesting, one of the things that Noel Pearson raised was he, he contrasted the same-sex marriage plebiscite with Indigenous Australians, and he said, um, unlike same-sex marriage, there's not the requisite empathy or love to break through the prejudice, contempt, and yes, violence of the past. Australians simply do not have Aboriginal people within their circles of family and friendship. Um, so his 
I think his view is that there's a lot of work to be done to bring people along on that journey. Deidre, do you think, uh, do you have any fears about our capacity to go through that journey within the time frame that we've got? And have you thought about what would happen, for example, if this is unsuccessful? Sure. And certainly I have fears and, uh, and certainly respect what Andrea is saying about the opportunity for misinformation. Again, I'd say Tony Abbott and think of the low bar that you mentioned earlier, but um, just in terms of the, the people that we give credit to in terms of that influence. Um, uh, so I do have those fears, but I also have a great sense of optimism. I mean, for those of you who have not heard Noel um, Pearson's Boyer Lecture, I really appeal to you to listen to it. It, it is inspiring, it is sobering, and it's confronting. And, uh, you know, he's, he's painting the picture of this being an absolutely pivotal moment uh, in the history of Aboriginal um, uh, change since uh, invasion and since the first sort of unsettlement of the people of this country, the first peoples of this country. And he does it eloquently and very, very clearly. And one of the things he's pointing out, um, which I think we'd all be aware, is we're one of the only countries in the world never to have made peace with our first peoples. There's no treaty, there's no instrument of recognition, and, and it's a glaring light uh, on the history of our country and our sense of ourselves as a people. Now, I'm not wanting to spread the risk back to individuals, but I do think people should educate themselves, listen to that lecture, and in a sense, as people did in the 67 um, referendum, is to actually get out there and sell that message. I think Noel Pearson makes a really strong point when he says Aboriginal people are, if you like, in a sense of sort of abject um, disaffection uh, by the Australian people. Quite shocking, because that's not how we see ourselves. We see ourselves as, uh, you know, the fair go and so on. But he's appealing, basically, to that notion of individuals actually getting out there and doing the hard work. Um, I agree that we need bipartisan support. Of course we need that to see this happen. However, we may not get it. Mm. And even if we get that, in a sense, in the parliament, because there's, uh, you know, uh, people don't want to have that sense of responsibility and what it might cost them electorally, there will be a lot of weevils in the uh, in the wheat out there trying to undermine. And this is, you know, a really powerful uh, opportunity. Megan Davis was talking today and Pat Anderson of the optimism they feel. They are saying, go now, go now while there's a movement for change and get out there and campaign for it. And what I see at the moment is this sort of vacuum. We're in a liminal space of people are waiting to hear, you know, that the, the gun shot to say the race has started. Um, and I just would appeal to everybody here to have a listen to that lecture. And I have to say, uh, I've not seen eye to eye with Noel Pearson on lots of things over a period of time. And uh, sometimes listening to his uh, dulcet tones that are slightly um, sermonising can, you know, can raise other thoughts. This is a powerful lecture and series of lectures. And this is a pivotal moment. And in 1967, it was the people that made that change to the referendum. And here we are all these decades on. And as I said earlier, I think Aboriginal people are still waiting for that point of recognition. We have the announcement uh, uh, today that the South Australian government is looking at uh, its own local level voice to parliament. That's not a constitutional change. That is a, a, a well, uh, you know, well received opportunity uh, to, to hear from Aboriginal people. But it is this fundamental change to our constitution that will right a wrong. And in the words of um, Justice Woodward from the Northern Territory legislation, brought that in for the land rights leg legislation in 1976. Dunstan repeated these words with the Pitjantjatjara Land Rights Act. This is simply an uh, this is an act of simple justice, and I think that's what uh, we've got the opportunity to be a part of. I just yeah. I would I'd like to add one more point to that, and I think that was beautifully said. Um, you asked, Misha, what's changed? What's changed in 2022? When I think it's worth pointing out that when Anthony Albanese gave his um, victory speech, one of his, his first priorities was having a voice to parliament. And there's a lovely article in the book by Ariadne Roman, actually, that looks at what is going to be different 
and it's early days, I, I, I pay that. But what's different about the election of the Albanese government? And so far, I think we're seeing a more consensual government. We're moving away from some of those um, ideological cultural wars and doing that symbolism, um, and it's more than that, of pinpointing that that was a priority on the very first day of the new government um, is a reason for optimism. What I'm wondering, Deirdre, your view, what is Albanese not doing? Every speech is given, uh, he opens by the acknowledgement of country and then saying, and we will legislate for the voice. But you referred to a vacuum. Mm. What isn't happening? Mm. I, think it, I think it is actually um, partly a media issue. It is seen as one of the lower issues, like people are featuring the budget, they're featuring the crises, they're featuring all of these things. You know, it is the allies and the champions and the solidarity that is needed. And that's got to come from the media as well. I think there's a bit of nervousness across the parliament um, and there's also an awareness and uh, some sense, and I'm sure Albanese feels that uh, also, not all Aboriginal people agree with the voice. There's also a multiplicity of opinions within the Aboriginal Community. Including in the Parliament, Jacinta Price, for example. Exactly, exactly. So there is, uh, Jacinta Price is a good example, there is that sort of um, uh, dissent. But we're naive if we're going to wait around for all Aboriginal people to agree to each other and disrespectful. Aboriginal people have a diversity of views like anyone else uh, in the country and have a right to those. So I think there's some of those elements where there's, where, where are the feature articles about what the voice can mean? Where are the articles about the Sami Parliament and, you know, this has been operating for years, it's nothing to be frightened of. Um, there's been some media, but not much. So, as I say, I think that's about amplifying, you know, the opportunity that is there and having more debate about that. As I remember 67, and I walked with my dad to the polling booth in Waradau Primary School, and uh, I, I asked him, Dad, because the house, every household received a brochure, there were two questions yes. that day. One was about some Senate thing. And there was a for and against case presented to the household, and there was only a for case presented for the Aboriginal thing. I said, Dad, why is there only... It's the kind of question you ask when you... Mm. Know that. And um, he said, well, because no one disagrees. This is what we're doing today. We're recognising Aboriginal people. And in a way, as I remember it in 67, and I was at a young age reading the newspaper, uh, you know, religiously, which is, you know, not common, or maybe it was common then. Anyway, <laughs> I was reading it religiously. And there wasn't, as I remember 67, there wasn't a debate. It was, in fact, the opposite. Mm. There were, I don't remember op-eds about it. It was just, this is something we're going to do. Both sides have decided it. Well, there is an entitlement under um, the legislation that governs referendum that both sides get equal amounts of money for campaigning of so the public purse. Um, well, yeah. well in any case, that's the state for this referendum that will be approaching, that there will be an entitlement for equal funds. For a no case. So there be, has to be equal funds for a no case on this. Yes, yes, there will have to be, and there was with the same-sex um, uh, legislation same-sex marriage legislation. I mean, I think one of the things I had in 67, apart from the fact, and, and Noel reflects on it, um, that it's not, it wasn't, um, it, it didn't materially alter the lives of Aboriginal Australians, First Nations Australians, in the way the voice to Parliament will. So it was I not it as mattered contentious. mattered a lot. I think it they mattered. felt very good after. Very significant. Not better. But what people had was a very strong, you know, there was a body called Fakatsi. There were allies and friends and solidarity from the Australian people who were saying, you know, uh, I remember posters with um, a small Aboriginal child on it, vote yes, and it was, right. you know, this sense of inclusion, this sense of this is a basic um, simple justice, act of justice, and that's the kind of positioning and framing of this debate I think we sorely need at the moment. But I, I do think it is up to us. It had a movement of people, a social movement behind uh, this recognition, and uh, I think that's where we're moving to. I'm actually confident we'll move to it, um, as we did with the same-sex legislation, which was enormously contentious um, initially. 
initially. Okay, we're going to have to we're going to have to wrap up there. Um, we're a little bit over time, um, and I think it's a great note to end on actually, because I think what you've what you've said is optimistic, but it's also sort of saying that there's work to be done. So I think to some extent the answer to the question about what's changed is really quite a lot, um, but there's still a lot more that hopefully in various ways is going to change. Just to um, quickly flip Noel's comment um, about the concern of the um, abject nature of Aboriginal Australians in Australia today, what that means, there's uh, uh, another piece that I've heard where, where people ask the question, Aboriginal people ask the question, what if the government loved us? So I just want to leave it there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you everybody for coming. Um, if we could thank our panel, I think that was a terrific discussion. Thank you so much everybody.